Can we say thank you to our kids one more time for leading us in worship this morning? Thank you so much. If you're here for Christmas, you heard them sing, uh, lead us in Hosanna on Christmas Eve. And they're leading us in Hosanna again. They're helping us understand the, the arrival of Jesus at the beginning of the story. They're helping us appreciate the, the Holy Week at the end of Jesus' story as it's revealed in the Gospels. And so thankful to Christy and Rana for the leadership and the care and the investment that they have put into them. Uh, it is a gift to be led by people who sing with passion and a sense of wonder and beauty. So we're grateful uh, to have them here today. Let's do this. Let's pray and ask that God would open up our minds and our hearts to receive truth from him as we look in the scriptures this morning. God, today is a day that is a gift from you. And you have brought all of us here together and invited those who are joining us online to receive a gift of your truth. And Lord, there are some of us today who, who really are singing that song with our hearts, Hosanna. Some of us are singing it out of celebration because we've seen you've done good in our lives in this week. Some of us are singing it with anticipation because there's an area of our lives in which we, we need to be saved. We need to be rescued. We need to experience um, your deliverance or your intervention in a relationship or a set of circumstances or a personal challenge. And we come today, some of us, with a anxious and heavy hearts. We, we need to be reminded that you are a God who sees us and you are a God who saves. So Lord, open up our minds and our hearts to receive the gift that you want to give. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On June 2nd, 1953, the eyes of the world were turned towards Westminster Abbey in London. Because this would be the day that Elizabeth II would become queen. And after a lengthy ceremony there, she is in fact crowned, not only queen of the United Kingdom, but also of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon. 29,000 people marched in procession with her to the abbey, and the streets were lined by an additional 16,000 spectators. If the coronation was held again today, it would cost roughly 51 million U.S. dollars to produce. Why? Because a coronation only happens once in a lifetime. So today's Palm Sunday. It's a chance we look back in the scriptures and are reminded that, that a guy rode a donkey into a city 2,000 years ago and people welcomed him by waving palm leaves. And some of us are like, I don't get what the big deal is. And the truth is this. The big deal is that a king only comes once in a lifetime. And the people were celebrating the arrival of Jesus because it was a moment marker. It was a game changer. It was a historic twist of events in the turn of their lives, of their corporate identity, and their nation's future. So let's look at the text together. Luke chapter 19 captures the story. It says, After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. They brought it to, so they, they were sent ahead, they went, they found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you stealing our donkey? They replied, the Lord said that we could, uh, we'll bring it back. They brought it to Jesus, they threw their cloaks on the colt, they put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. They're kind of laying out a very rudimentary version of a red carpet. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives into this valley before it goes back up to the city of Jerusalem, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they shouted. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, these are words that at first glance you might say, oh, they're excited, that makes sense. But the truth is they're actually quoting an ancient psalm from their own tradition. In, in Jewish heritage, when a king was being welcomed or a king was being crowned, people may have sung this psalm. So the words that they're saying aren't just like a worship song that they kind of pulled out of the playlist. These are words that are loaded with spiritual and political significance. To fully appreciate them, we need to take a look at Psalm 118 itself. 
It says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So the person that everybody overlooked was actually the star of the show. The Lord has done this. It's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. There's that Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, from the temple of God, we bless you. With boughs or branches in our hands, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. They're saying, we're welcoming the king. He's going to lead us in worship. We're going to offer sacrifices. And life as we know it will change. When they sing this song, they're saying, today is our day. Today the winds of destiny blow in our direction. Today we receive the blessing of God and finally a Messiah who can restore our national fortunes. Save in this context has military connotations. When the people are singing save us, they're not saying save us from our sins. They're saying be the hero, be the military leader who saves us from our enemies, who rescues us from our rivals our antagonists, our oppressors. And in this case, they had a very specific people group that they were talking about. They were talking about the Romans. At this point in history, the Romans had conquered pretty much all of the ancient world and they had set up a fortress in the center of Jerusalem to remind the people of Jerusalem that they were under Roman rule. The story continues. Some of, Jesus Pharise- some of the Pharisees, the religious leaders in the crowd, said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would really bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now, in our country, when we inaugurate a new leader, we have a party and then we let that person make a speech. And usually they put a lot of time and thought into their speech. They thought through every word, every gesture, every pause. They put it on a teleprompter and they try to sound confident and authoritative. They're controlled. When Jesus gives his speech, he crumples into a heap and weeps. And to the very people who just said, save us from our enemies, he goes, you know what? Because you don't fully realize who I am and what I represent, your your enemies will actually win over you. This is supposed to be an epic moment. It's supposed to be Jesus' high point. Jesus is riding on a wave of popularity that should take him to a position of power, but now he's crying. He goes, Jerusalem, you just don't get it. You don't recognize the time of God's coming to you. It's here and it's now, and and you refuse to appreciate it. And as a result, your story will end in tragedy and not triumph. See, it's at this point in the story that something very strange happens. Jesus enters the city through the eastern gate. And when he does, he's standing at a crossroads. Craig Reese, our lead pastor, is reminding me that this is true. So if you see the, see the eastern gate there, like at the base of the wall, there's a little ramp. There's the gate. Jesus would have come down the Mount of Olives, which is here where the balcony is, gone through the Kidron Valley, and gone up to the front doors. And you'll notice that there's this big square. That's the temple complex. That building in the center is the actual temple. But if you go up and right to the corner, do you see those four pillars? That's the Antonio Fortress. So when Jesus goes in the gate, he can go left towards the temple, or he can go right towards the fortress. The fortress is the Roman fort that, as you can see, is almost immediately adjacent to the temple. One ancient Jewish historian, a guy by the name of Josephus, wrote, a Roman cohort, so a group of Roman soldiers, was permanently quartered there. And at the festivals, they took up positions in arms around the porticos, which would have been the porches around the edges of the plaza to watch the people and repress any insurrectionary movement. 
Well, this was a festival week. The Jews are getting ready to celebrate Passover. So the Romans are going to be out in force. They're going to be visible. They're going to be present. And of course, they're going to be armed. However, if the entire city decided to revolt, the Romans would be outnumbered. Yeah, they, they, they'd take down a bunch of civilians with them before they finally succumbed. But at least in the short run, if the entire city turned against the fortress, they could take it. It would take the Romans some time before reinforcements arrived. So if Jesus turns right, he can confront Rome. If Jesus turns right, the revolution will begin. If Jesus turns right, Israel might finally be free. But if he turns left, he comes to the temple, the center of Jewish religious life. If he turns left, he'll call out his own people for their wrong thinking and their behavior. If he turns left, he'll alienate his religious enemies. If he turns left, he will squander all of the popularity that he has come upon in this moment. And as Jesus stands on the inside of the gate, everybody is waiting to see what he'll do. And Jesus turns left. Jesus turns left. And this is what he said. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. They were selling animals because people were traveling from all over the region. It didn't make sense for them to travel with animals. It would have been expensive. So what they would do is they'd bring, they'd bring cash. they get to the temple complex. They would buy an ox. They would buy a sheep. They would buy a lamb if they were really poor. They would buy a couple of birds. And then they would sacrifice those at the temple for Passover. Jesus drove out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Some of you have heard that line before. My house will be called a house of prayer. I grew up in a church that had to put a high value on praying regularly and publicly and passionately. And everybody said, like, yeah, we want church to be a house of prayer. When Jesus calls the temple of house of prayer, he's not so much referring to what the temple is for. He's actually referring to who the temple is for. And in order to fully understand this, we need to look at the passage that he is quoting, which is Isaiah chapter 56, verses 4 through 7. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, the prophet foretold that a day would come when eunuchs would get a place inside the temple. So a eunuch is somebody who has been castrated or it is a male who has missing or malformed genitals. And in the ancient Hebrew code, if you were a eunuch or if you had any physical deformity of any kind, you weren't allowed in the temple. Your body wasn't perfect and you weren't allowed in a sacred place. And Jesus is saying what? He says, not only will eunuchs be allowed in the temple complex, they will be allowed in the temple itself. And he goes, eunuchs, in this new economy, in this new kingdom of God, eunuchs will find a family. And people who have spent the entirety of their lives feeling like they were on the outside looking in, people who couldn't have families, people who couldn't have intimate relationships, people who had always been kept at arm's length would get a key role in the family of God. Isaiah's listeners would have had fuses blowing in their brains because they're like, wait, God's going to break his own rules? And maybe you... Maybe you're a person who your whole life felt like church people wanted to keep you on the outside. 
that because of your past or because of your appearance or because of your identity or because of your longings, you were just, it was just implied that you didn't get to come inside. And I want to remind you that Jesus says that you matter to him. And he is inviting you to know him, to be loved by him, and walk with him. Jesus is telling everybody who's in Jerusalem that that the eunuchs, people that they thought were outsiders, people that they thought were strange and weird, should be welcomed. That they get a seat at the table. And then he says this, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy. What's he saying? He goes, foreigners are going to find faith. Outsiders who had been relegated to spectator status will actually get promoted to servants of God. They don't just get to watch the service. They get to participate in the service. They'll be not just in the back. They'll be on the stage. He's saying, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar because my house will be called a house of prayer. That's the what? For all nations. That's the who. And Jesus is frustrated. Not because people are selling. They're selling because they have to. What they were doing wasn't wrong. People had to offer their sacrifices by law. Where they were doing it is what is infuriating to Jesus. When you look at the temple compound, there was that plaza. The outer edge was the court of the Gentiles. If you were not born Jewish, that was the closest you could come to God. And then inside of that was the court of the Jewish women. Inside of that was the court of the Jewish men. And inside of that was the temple itself. So the hierarchy went Jewish priests, Jewish men, Jewish women, and Gentiles. They didn't didn't get to come close, but they got to come in. And Jesus was saying, they don't have access to God because you crowded them out. The one place that was designated for outsiders to feel welcome has a huge keep out sign blazoned over the front of it. Jesus said, the Lord is bringing outsiders in. That's his character, that's his way, that's his desire. And you keep pushing them out. Enough. Author Stephen Chalk writes this story. He says, in the frenzy of battle during World War II, it wasn't always possible to return fallen soldiers to their homeland for burial. Many lay where they fell and remain in anonymous graves. A U.S. company was fighting in the heart of the French countryside and approached a Catholic priest to ask if they could bury their fallen comrade in a small graveyard attached to the church. But the priest turned them down on two counts. First, their friend wasn't Catholic. He didn't belong there. Second, the church cemetery was already full. Even if he did believe the right doctrine, there wasn't space to put him in. And so disappointed and heartbroken, the soldiers decided to bury their friend as close to the fence as they could but on the outside of it. And they marked his resting place with a simple wooden cross. Months later, when combat operations were over, the war had ended, this company of U.S. soldiers made their way back through the French countryside to that very same church so that they could pay their final respects before they went home. And to their horror, they could not find their friend's grave. And in rage and anger, they stormed up the steps of the church and confronted the priest and said, what did you do? And the priest said, when I saw the dignity and the honor with which you buried your friend, I was filled with anguish because of the decision that I made. He goes, but because the cemetery was full, there wasn't much I could do except for this. I moved the fence about six yards further so that your friend's grave would now be included within the boundaries of the cemetery. I hope that's okay by you. And Stephen Chalk said, one of the most controversial aspects of Jesus' ministry is that he keeps moving the fences. And the reason that Jesus' heart is broken, the reason that Jesus is coming out with just guns blazing on Palm Sunday is he's reminding the citizens of Jerusalem that their fences have come in too close. 
And Jesus is challenging their understanding of who gets to belong in the family of God. Now, I want to be clear about this. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one can get to the Father without going through Jesus. But if you go through Jesus, anyone can come. If you go through Jesus, anyone can come. If you go through Jesus, anyone can come. Regardless of your past, regardless of your identity, regardless of your race, regardless of your status, regardless of your wealth or your education, regardless of your preferences or your ideology, you can come. Jesus turns left. And when he does so, he moves our fences. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem, he turns left. And when he does so, he exposes our idols. Jesus turned left because Jerusalem had forgotten the nations. And Jesus turns left because Jerusalem was guilty of idolatry. He calls them a den of robbers. And when he does so, he's quoting the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verses 9 through 11 say this. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. That Jesus is saying, you don't get to do whatever you want and then run back to the temple and say, we're safe. Ever watch one of those crime scenes where somebody commits like a murder in Manhattan, but then it turns out that they have diplomatic immunity and they can't be prosecuted? How, how many of you, when you were kids, you played tag? Anybody else play tag? And did you have a home? Did you have like a safe, did you have base where if you got, like, got back to base, you were safe? And nobody could tag you? I could like point to the tree in my parents' backyard that was our safe zone. And if you were a tag master, you knew exactly how many yards you could go outside of the safe zone, taunt your friend, and then get back just in the nick of time. Like that's what tag champions do. They, they are always measuring their proximity to base. Jesus is saying, that's what you're doing. You guys will run out and raise hell. You're committing adultery, you're robbing people, you're dishonoring God, you're stepping on the poor, you're doing all of these things that are reckless, that are in direct violation of what you know God has asked you to do. But because you live in Jerusalem, because you live in the shadow of the temple, you just run back and you touch the altar and you're like, I'm safe. Nobody can get me now because this is God's magic place. God's not going to destroy our town. This is where he set up shop. We can do whatever we want. Now, God had allowed their temple to be destroyed once before when the Babylonians burned it 500 years earlier. And most people in Jerusalem would say, that, that was like a, a once-in-a-history kind of deal. God would never destroy it again, would he? But when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, what exactly is he prophesying? When he says not one of these stones will be left on top of one another, he's saying the temple's going to fall. When Jesus turns left, he reminds us he has zero tolerance for our idols. And the truth is, just because we can wrap our idols in religious words doesn't mean that they're anything other than idols. If we worship our politics or our doctrine more than Jesus, if we worship our ideology or our lifestyle more than Jesus, if we worship our comfort and our pleasure more than Jesus, if we worship our nationalism and our tribalism more than Jesus, we're wrong no matter how many verses we know. Why is Jesus weeping? Because he knew where their worship of religion would take them. Jesus knew that their view of the temple was too small. For all of its history and all of its beauty and all of its nostalgia, the temple was never going to be enough to save them. In a matter of days, Jesus knows that he's going to die. 
And when Jesus dies, what do we learn happens on Good Friday? That as soon as Jesus breathes his last breath, there's a curtain in the temple that separates the holy place from the rest of it, that separates a perfect God from an imperfect people. And when Jesus breathes his last, the curtain in that temple is torn in two from top to bottom. It is shredded beyond any measure of usability. So what does Jesus know that the people of Jerusalem don't know? That in a matter of days, the temple is going to be obsolete. God is not going to need it anymore. So the one pile of bricks that everybody's put their confidence in actually has an expiration date. And it is sooner than they know. See, God discarded the temple a generation before the Romans destroyed it. And he did it when he sent Jesus to die on our behalf. See, Jesus, Jesus actually said this in John chapter 2. He answered them, he goes, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. And they laughed at him. They're like, nope, this temple took 46 years to build. There's no way you're going to rebuild it in three days. Well, Jesus wasn't talking about the physical structure. He was talking about himself. And he goes, you put all your stock in that when all you really need is this. Where are your fences? Where are your fences? Where have you decided in your mind that there are certain people who just don't get to partake of the blessings of God? That if it were up to you, this individual, this enemy, this rival, that tribe, that people group, that party, would never sit down at the table of God with you. Is it possible that this Friday God wants to, God wants to move your fences? Or maybe you, like I, you got a version of the temple in your life. Something that is less than Jesus, that you have put your confidence and hope for salvation in. And God, in Good Friday, is reminding you that whatever that is, it is not enough. And that when it crumbles and it falls, Jesus will be standing there with open arms saying, are you ready to trust me now? See, when Jesus turns left, he moves our fences. When Jesus turns left, he exposes our idols. When Jesus turns left, he picks up our cross and says the only way to fully experience life is to lay the one that you have down. Now, Craig's going to be preaching on Good Friday, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, but one of my favorite moments of the Good Friday story is when the Romans give Jesus a cross to carry, and he stumbles and when he does, they pick a man out of the crowd, Simon the Cyrene, to carry it for him. And sometimes you actually see in religious art or imagery, the caption will be, Simon carries Jesus' cross. Well, the truth is, he's not carrying Jesus' cross. He's helping Jesus carry his. Because Jesus doesn't deserve a cross. All he was doing was carrying yours. And carrying mine. And Jesus told anybody who was listening to him, he goes, if you want to follow me, I need you to deny yourself every day. And I want you to pick up your cross and follow me. Like full disclosure, sometimes I think that denying myself and following Jesus is like getting my registration renewed on my birthday. It's like something that happens once a year. Holidays are a great time. I'll, I'll do my spiritual inventory and that'll be good until the next time around. Jesus says, if you want to walk with me, I need you to deny yourself daily. And I'll be completely honest with you. If it were up to me, I would vote for a Jesus who turns right. I would, I would vote for a Jesus who lets me keep my life intact just as it is. I would vote for a Jesus who destroys all of the people that I don't agree with and that I don't like. I would vote for a Jesus who lets me keep my little version of my temple intact. But Jesus didn't turn right. Jesus turns left. And when he does, he tells us what is true about himself. He loves us so much he's going to lay down his life for us. He tells us something about us, that we're prone to wander and rebel. And he tells us something about others that they matter to God in ways that we have not even stopped to consider. 
My prayer for us this Palm Sunday is that we would have a picture of Jesus who makes us uncomfortable because he loves us and wants to set us free from our fences, from our idols, and our commitment to a picture of spiritual security that is not at all what he has in mind.